reality. We and you say third coast. <laughs> yeah. It's such a delight to be here tonight. Utilizing the gift of song that I've been blessed with. To bring to y'all so much joy. And you know like I know. Don't nothing bring more joy than a clean cut New Orleans boy, huh? They say I wouldn't do it again. It's another episode of Concrete Reality TV where we strive to know more and do more with what we know. This segment is called Houston Hometown Heroes, where we sit down to talk with past and present professionals that have been impactful through various aspects of the city of Houston. I am Ephraim Acapella, your podcast host. And today's special guest is another great Houstonian professional that has helped to mold the musical minds of thousands of students, including myself. She is a musician, educator, conductor, and was the vocal department chair of the Kinder High School for the Performing and Visual Arts in Houston, Texas for 46 years. It is my pleasure and honor to have Miss Patricia Bonner on today's show. What's up, Miss Bonner? How are you doing today? Well, I'm doing just great, and thank you for having me. I'm so glad to reconnect with you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm excited to um, get to interview you. So I wanted to jump right on in to figure out what are you doing? Because you said you're retired now? Yes. I, I got the opportunity, I always say, to retire <laughs> because uh, I was waiting for us to move to the new building, uh, which is in downtown Houston. Uh, we, had, we were in the second building, and I thought, well, once we move into the new building, which originally was going to be 2017, uh, but there was some delay through HISD and being sure that we had the funds and all of that. So we weren't able to move in until 2019. And then that's when I taught because I wanted to say that I had actually taught at all three of the HSPBA campuses. Right now, if you'll excuse me a minute, I'm going to reach over here and get my calendar. Mm -hmm. And you ask what I'm doing now. We just finished October. And I'm going to see if I can hold the calendar in front of the camera. So you're pretty busy, huh? And now we're into November, and this is November. So you just retired in um, paper. You're not actually That's retired. Right. Basically, <laughs> uh, I, I basically retired on paper. What I do, a lot of things that I like to do, I have what I call a number of volunteer gigs. I, of course, volunteer quite often at HSPBA. I give tours of the new facility. Everyone's anxious to see it. I volunteer with the PTO. I volunteer with the uh, H, uh, uh, with the uh, Black Alumni Association when they're having meetings or things like that. I try to keep up with them. Mm -hmm. I volunteer uh, uh, at the school store. That's through the PTO. I just started doing that this year. I do that one afternoon a week. And I volunteer with our magnet coordinator for uh, three or four times to go to the different magnet fairs, which are exhibitions really at the um, various middle schools and sometimes at a high school at night where all of the magnet schools in HISD uh, set up a table and then students and their parents can come and ask about the various programs as these seventh and eighth graders are preparing to go into high school. So that's one of my gigs. I just started doing that last year and just started working the school store this year. I volunteer with the Houston Association of Retired Teachers. I'm with them now. As a matter of fact, I'm chairman for the uh, for the holiday luncheon entertainment, uh, which I've helped get for the last two years. And so I'm getting the entertainment, and I usually use HSBBA people for obvious reasons for the entertainment. Mm -hmm. I also uh, work with them with an organization called Kids Meals. And on Wednesday mornings, the Houston Association of Retired Teachers, we're called HART, H-A-R-T. We go on uh, Wednesday mornings. We take the Wednesday morning shift uh, from 9 to about 1130-ish or so. And we make sandwiches. Kids Meals is an organization about 25, 26 years old. And they make sandwiches to give to the preschoolers who are at home, the three and four year olds who are at home. Older siblings can get their free breakfast and free lunch at school, but the younger ones don't. So in order for them to have a good lunch with a good snack and a piece of fruit and milk 
and juice. We make sandwiches of all kinds. Whatever meat is available that morning. Sometimes it's just peanut butter and jelly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just cheese and a and a taco uh, type shell or the tor uh, tortilla shell. Mm -hmm. We um, make those and they bag them. Kids meal will bag them and they serve well over forty zip codes in the greater Houston area where they deliver these sack lunches to the three and four year olds. So every Wednesday morning, I'm over there with heart to help make those uh, sandwiches. Whatever I can do, I like to stay active and uh, it's great fun. And in between times, my other hobby is attending concerts. And that's what I do a lot of just uh, without any work to do. I attend concerts in the theater district. And of course I attend practically everything I can at HSPVA. Wow. You still don't slow down because I remember in school, you were the same way that you are now, constantly moving, busy, always on it. And it seems like you're still doing the same thing. Well, I want to try to do it while I can. You know, eventually, old age will catch up with you. Maybe you can't do as much. Mm -hmm. So I said to myself, as long as I'm healthy and able to do it, I'm going to keep going. And I'm enjoying it. This is, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a good life being mm -hmm. able to do that and uh, uh, say that I have seen all these different plays and that I can be a patron to all of the different arts organizations. We push those so much here in Houston, but now I'm able to say that I can do that. And of course, the other thing that I'm able to do now that I always did before, I always traveled in the summer, but being retired now, I can travel anytime during the school year. Uh, one of the reasons I retired is because I wanted to go uh, during the spring of the year on a trip to the Holy Lands. Well, I'm so glad that we, I was able to do that last year. I was scheduled to do it in 2020, and of course with COVID, nobody traveled anywhere. But I did got, get a chance to go when they uh, rebooked the trip in September of 2022. Got a chance to take the trip to the Holy Land. Wow. Uh, I go to New York. Uh, I try to go to New York at least twice a year because we have so many of our alums who are doing such wonderful things in various jobs in New York, performing, working with musical organizations and, and other non-arts related uh, jobs. But it's wonderful to get a chance to go. Uh, this year I went in January mm -hmm. and then I went again in September. And I try to go at least twice a year there. And I'm planning another trip uh, in the spring, uh, maybe a trip with uh, the biblical resources to travel the final missionary journeys of St. Paul. And so I'm looking forward to that in April. All of that I could not do while I was teaching because mm -hmm. I would have to wait until the summer. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm enjoying everything I can while I can and while I can get around. Basically, you're still working, but at the same time, you're getting some leisure time as well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Wow. Well, I wanted to take it back because I remember basically as children or youth you know, we're selfish. We think the world revolves around us and then we don't really think about teachers and how you guys got to the point in your life where you were able to start sewing into the youth like you do. And now I'm older and I wanted to know more about all of these different people that, you know, helped me to become who I am. So thus you on the show, uh, I'm really curious about learning about your life, you know, where you grew up, your parents, your upbringing, how you got to the place that you are now in your life. So I wanted to start, I guess, with were you born in Houston? I am one of the very rare breeds. I was actually born right here in Houston. Hmm. I didn't know that. It was back in the dark ages, but I was born <laughs> right here in Houston. <laughs> what year were you born? I don't think they even marked that year. <laughs> were you? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> what part of Houston were you born? I was born... But it's now it wasn't as big as it was way back then. Mm -hmm. But I was actually born in Herman Hospital. Oh, okay. But uh, yeah, you know, which is now the part of the medical center that's really at the beginning of the medical center. So all of that that's over there now had not been there. But I was born actually at Herman Hospital, and uh, the, my very early years were in part of Six Ward uh, near Washington Avenue and the Heights Boulevard uh, mm -hmm. that has been so gentrified now. No one can really even drive through it almost. So I was right there until probably, I just don't remember those years, but I do remember going, oh, maybe, I guess I can sort of remember kindergarten and 
first grade and second grade. But by that time, we had moved to what was called the West End at that time. It's now the section that's called Part of the Heights. Mm, uh, okay. We moved to that section. But I still attended uh, Harper School, which was in that Six Ward area. Harper School was at that time, because you have to remember, this was during the years of segregation. Mm -hmm. But Harper School was still there on Center Street, right behind Washington Avenue and Studemont. And at that time, we attended from kindergarten through eighth grade. And that included all of the people who lived in the various parts of Sixth Ward, all the people who lived in what was called the West End, which was the part that was west of uh, Yale Street. And then some of those who lived in the deep West End, which was on the other side of Memorial and Washington Avenue, all of those, all of us had to come together for school. If we lived in Sixth Ward or the West End, we started kindergarten at Harper. And then we continued on through junior high, which was at that time, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Now the others who joined us, some of them came from what was called the Highland Heights area, and some came from that deep West End that I talked about. That was an elementary school in those areas where they could attend those elementary schools. But then uh, they would come to Harper again, passing up several other schools because of segregation. And all of us would come together at Harper in the seventh grade. So I have many, many friends now that I have known since seventh grade. We're still close. And I have several friends that I've known. We started school in kindergarten many, 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 many moves ago. And we're still friends because we went K through ninth grade at Harper. And then from there, we all had to uh, catch a bus or, if you know, somebody might have had a car. We were all poor, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, somebody might have had a car, but most of the time it was those who lived close to Booker T. Washington went there, and the rest of us would ride a city bus. We didn't even have a school bus. We would ride the city bus uh, to uh, Booker T. Washington High School, and sometimes there would be someone in the neighborhood who might have a car, and some of us would have an opportunity to ride. I remember riding to Booker T. Washington with our one of our ministers at our church. His daughter, he had been assigned to our our church, and his daughter was going to be going to Booker T. Washington, and I, and and uh, she was just one year ahead of me. And so for a couple of years, I was able to ride with them to school, but we always rode the bus home. But it wasn't a school bus. It was uh, the city, city bus. bus. We were passing up schools and transferring. But, you know, we got an excellent education because we had such really, really wonderful teachers. And even though at the time... Uh, segregation was really, really bad, and I'm sure that we missed out on some opportunities, but because of the teachers that we had, they really, really poured themselves into getting us educated, and that's how I was inspired to become a teacher, because of all of the many wonderful teachers I had, both at Harper and then at the Booker T. Washington. I just, I think from maybe second or third grade on, that was just no doubt that I wanted to be a teacher, because I watched them and I saw how dedicated they were, and uh, I just decided that's what I'm going to do, and I did it. Wow. I want to touch back real quick with your upbringing. Um, were you raised by your mother and father as well? Uh, well, basically by my mother with my grandparents across the, grandparents across the street. Uh, my father uh, passed away when I was, uh, I think, 11 or 12, mm -hmm. I believe, that it passed away. But my mother had moved in the meantime uh, in the West End, and it was... It happened to be across from my grandparents. So it was basically my mother with my grandparents. But because um, my mother had uh, seven sisters, it was just a big family. Hmm. Uh, so there were lots of cousins in all of this, a lot of cousins in all of this. People say, how do you get so many first cousins? I say, well, your parents and your grandparents have to have lots of siblings. <laughs> That's how we get first cousins and other cousins. Mm -hmm. So I was just raised as a family group. We were all kind of just raised that together, always with my cousins on the Sunday afternoon, and we all were going to the same high school at, you know, at different times, sometimes at the same time, we were all going to Harper. So that's how it was more being raised by a complete family. Mm -hmm. And we're still all, you know, my cousins and I, we're still all close today. Do you have any siblings or is it just you? I have a, a brother who lives in Oklahoma City now, but he, he he's a graduate of Bishop College. And he taught for a few years, but he didn't have the teaching bug. <laughs> he just 
So he he tries lots of different things and many kinds of businesses. You know, getting them started. Some some uh, in Houston and some in Seattle and places like that. But he did he, for several years. He was a teacher, and then my sister, who also was a teacher, uh, she taught for several years, and she thought, oh, I'm going to hang this up. And then she worked for uh, places like. Um, IBM and Bechtel. She went into business, the business world. Okay. Now she did that for many, many, many years. And then once she and her husband, once she moved out to San Diego, then she um, she kept kept up with business, you know, with uh, a lot of working from home and a lot of going out of town to different jobs. But then once her husband, who was a uh, San Diego firefighter, when he retired, they thought they wanted to move back to Houston. Number one, it was cheaper living in Houston than in San Diego. And also, with the weather here, my brother-in-law loved to, to play golf. So when he retires, being a firefighter, they moved back here to Houston. That's been, oh, 20, 23 years ago, something like that. And so my, te- my sister came back, and then she taught for several more years here after moving back to Houston. And then she, but we can't, I guess you can't call it retired. She just stopped the teaching. But then a few years back, she resumed teaching and she taught uh, business entrepreneurship at at the community college, which is what she taught. She taught at Lamar High School Mm -hmm. when she came back from San Diego. She taught that business entrepreneurship. And uh, then when she started teaching at the community college, she continued teaching that business entrepreneurship, but she just stopped that about a year, year and a half ago. And it was just a part-time job for her. So at one point, we were all <laughs> teaching, you know, and then um, uh, I, I stayed with it because that was all I ever wanted to do, and they kind of went their other ways, so but we stuck with it. Then I had uh, uh, some cousins who were teachers, uh, a niece who was in education and is teaching, and we have several other um not first cousins, but other cousins who are teachers. So education is kind of a big thing in our family. We were taught you need to get a good education because that's how you'll make it in the world. Mm -hmm. But then also we were all, I think, so impressed with our teachers that there's several people who were teachers. Some have retired now, some are still teaching in our family. When did you start falling in love with music? Oh, I guess it was all along because... As you probably know, most of us growing up in the church, we sang, you know, in the children and the youth choirs and all of that. But then my mother got us started, my sister and me, she got us started taking piano lessons. I guess I must have been in maybe seventh grade, sixth or seventh grade at that time. And my sister was about two and a half years behind me. We started taking piano, especially through junior high school. But and my brother did trombone. He loved playing in the band. He did sports in the band. And my sister and I um, did took piano lessons, but I always sang in the choir of the Glee Club, whatever it was called, coming through Harper School and coming through Booker T. Washington. I was always with the choir and, of course, always with the church with the choir doing that. And for one while, while I was in college, I did play, just to live just a small job at my church for the children's choir. I then for a uh, a young adult choir. Uh, I played a piano for them uh, because I was taking the piano lessons. And then while I was in college studying music, continued to play with them for a for several years. But I was always involved in music, always singing. It was I didn't know at the time when I was maybe in elementary school or so that I would be take such a deep interest in music. I just knew I wanted to be a teacher. Hmm. But I think it's probably by the time I got to to junior high at that time and then beginning of high school, I knew it had to be music. Were you a vocalist first or a pianist? Well, vocalist, because we grew up singing in the children and youth choir. So with your parents, were they musicians as well? My mother sang in the church choir uh, in addition to other many, many jobs at church. So I, my family was just very, very involved in church. Grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, everybody mm-hmm. involved in church. And my mother did sing in the choir with some of her sisters and other friends there. Uh, my, I have an uncle, my father's brother, who was a professional. He was the only other professional musician in the family. His name was Weldon Bonner, mm-hmm. but his professional name, his stage name was Juke Boy Bonner. One man band mm-hmm. because he played, he had a harmonica around his neck, 
he had a bass drum, uh, uh, just a drum at his feet with the pedal, and he had the guitar, and he sang. So he was a one-man band, and he called himself Juke Boy Bonner, and he really was quite famous uh, in Europe. Uh, he's deceased now, died quite, oh, about 20 years ago, but he, uh, I think it may have been longer than 20 years ago, but he uh, was quite famous in Europe playing the blues. That's basically what he did. You could even Google him, Weldon Juke Boy Bonner, but basically playing the blues, and he was a one-man band. He did a lot of things in East Texas and a lot of things in in Europe. I have some cousins who would sing in church choir, another mm -hmm. cousin sang in the, the choir at school. I've had nieces and, and the nephews who play in the band at their schools. Mm -hmm. When they were in school, they played in the band and uh, uh, loved that opportunity. They like, I have a niece and nephew especially who loved marching band. Mm -hmm. And so I've had, had them to be involved that way. And that's about it as far as the ones in the family who were musicians were you outgoing did you love like going to the movies any favorite particular movies that stand out were you a people person the way you are now or did you grow into that well i've always been a people person but you have to remember Jeffrey, we didn't have any money to go to the movies so <laughs> no, it's not any favorite movie. every now and then you know once or twice a year we might get to the one movie that was available for yeah, keep in mind segregation that was available for blacks, and it was it was downtown Houston, and I want to say it was called the Lincoln Theater. That may not be correct, but there just were not a lot of movies. That was a drive-in at some point, and so going to movies was not that big a deal for us because we just didn't have it. We just kind of made our own entertainment. Uh, we were highly involved in church. We did games at home, mm -hmm. uh, board games and cards and things like that at home. We didn't do, you know, Six Flags wasn't around at that time. We just didn't have all those kinds of entertainment and these big uh, venues where you went to concerts. I mean, even if they had been around, we wouldn't have had the money to go. We were basically, we weren't poverty stricken, but we, you know, had enough to, to get by, but we didn't have enough for all those luxuries had they even been available, which most of them were not. But I can remember once or twice a year, maybe going mm -hmm. to a movie, but we would have to catch the bus mm -hmm. and go downtown to the movie. So a favorite movie growing up, I just don't even remember. But anytime I got attached to a favorite movie, it would have been generally as a, as a young adult, mm -hmm. you know, uh, getting more exposure as we, as things began to change in Houston. Okay. What about with the music styles? Were you into soul, blues, R&B, or straight gospel? Well, we grew up with that. You have to remember, back here in the dark ages, we grew up. <laughs> it wasn't the contemporary gospel that began in the 70s and 80s with, that, with you know, Andre Crouch and, and the others. Mm -hmm. Good music. I love that. Good music. But we had the uh, standard uh, gospel that would be associated more with what Aretha Franklin's father, Reverend C.L. Franklin, oh, okay. and others of his era the type of gospel music that they sang at that time. So I did enjoy that. I loved singing at church. We would sing small anthems at church in the youth choir, but we sang lots and lots and lots of hymns and Christmas mm. carols. I still know practically all of these because <laughs> I still do them at church. But uh, I really love, love, love classical music. I love opera. Uh, I love musical theater. Mm -hmm. I love the symphony. I go to the alley. I, I just love all, basically all forms of music. Mm. I don't know if I have a particular favorite, but I do. I lean more toward the classical music, and I definitely lean toward the big orchestral works that are orchestra plus chorus. There are so many of those, mm -hmm. and I really enjoy those. I got an opportunity uh, when I was in school. I attended the University of Houston, so I had an opportunity to sing a number of these large choral works with uh, the Houston uh, Symphony as well as with the University of Houston Symphony. So uh, I really lean a lot toward the classical music, but I, I uh, really enjoy a lot of the others. Some of the types of music that are out now, I let's say I enjoy less <laughs> than I do of other types. But you have to have a probably a healthy respect for it because that, that, that's a big business. Mm -hmm. All these forms of music that you had mentioned, you know, hip hop and all of the others, mm -hmm. they're a big business. And I can, I'm okay with anything that is a field with vulgar curse words, sexual mm -hmm. innuendos, and all kinds of things like that. Definitely. So uh, you respect them for the simple reason that that's a business, 
And if it's a good business giving people jobs, I'm, I'm okay with it. But, uh, you know, no one appreci appreciates or really loves every single kind of music. Mm -hmm. But I do try to appreciate all of the time, even if I don't particularly favor. Favorite, yeah. I remember in school, and I'm sure you uh, have heard this, it was always we, we could get in trouble, you know, if we were singing certain music such as gospel. And I remember when when it was understood that if Pat Bonner heard you singing gospel like that, you could get chewed out because you felt like it kind of messed up your vocal cords. Do you still feel that way now? Do you have a different opinion about that? Well, it's, it's just what you said. If I heard you singing gospel music, like that, mm -hmm. not singing gospel music, singing gospel music like that, which would be pushing and screaming. See, that's the difference between singing gospel music and singing gospel music like that. I always, I, we, I love the gospel groups we had at HSBA because they sang really good gospel and they weren't screaming and pushing their voices. That was the thing that we didn't encourage, mm -hmm. pushing and screaming on the voices. We knew that there were a number of people who over the weekends would do a lot of singing where they were really pushing and they'd come back on Monday and Tuesday and be hoarse. So the thing that we really did not want them to do was to push and scream and ruin the vocal cords. But I'm telling you, the gospel groups we have had at HSPDA have been wonderful because they're careful with how they sing mm -hmm. and they sing really good music. The first ones that we had on uh, the other campus, it was called uh, the Gospel Connection. And it was only about, I think about seven of them with the, the pianist. Then the next group we had was Reflection of Joy, and that was another seven. We had small groups, but they sang good gospel music, and they weren't screaming or um, using their voice in an unsafe manner. That was the problem that we had, not the mm. music itself, but using the voice in an unsafe manner. Yeah, that, that makes sense now. I think back then everyone was like, "You can't even sing gospel music." I'm as Bonner gonna get on you. Uh, uh, you get <laughs> only if you only if you abuse your vocal cords. Mm -hmm. That's funny. Going back to your high school a little bit, did you date at all? Were you allowed to date any boys? Was your mom super strict, or did you even focus on that when you were in middle school or high school? Most of the time, we just kind of, you know, groups of friends would maybe go someplace, but keep in mind now, we didn't have a lot of money for just about anything. So anything we did, we kind of did it kind of with a school group, mm -hmm. maybe something on the weekend. On the weekends, uh, my friends and I, we, we knew that where we were going to be on Sundays, uh, Saturdays, we were generally helping at home through the week. Every now and then, that would be some of us who would get together and we would be able to go. There were a couple of places that uh, they were small, black operated, hamburger places where you could get the hamburger and the malt and they were like walking distance from the school they were across the street or around the corner from the school and so sometimes some of us as friends were trying to do that you know i had good friends uh, uh boys and girls just good friends and we would do things together when we could uh we you know we, if you could catch the bus and go somewhere we you know walk up to the bus stop during the day and catch the bus we couldn't do that at night of course mm -hmm. so things were a little bit different uh, during that time. Did you go to your high school prom? Oh, yes. We all went to the prom. And those were big sacrifices for our parents. Mm -hmm. During this time, when I was in school, and it only stopped, I think, prom, oh, I was teaching before it stopped, I believe. I'm not sure the exact date. But during that time, uh, we had uh, what was called low and high. So you would have the, the low first and the high first, the low second, the high second the low 10th, the high 10th, and things like that. So we, uh, students could graduate in January, and then the other group could graduate in May. So those who graduated in January were people who were born in October, November, December, January, because they couldn't start the kindergarten until January. And those of us who were born in the earlier parts of the year, you know, May through August, whatever, we could start school uh, in September. We'd always start at the Labor Day. So we would start at that time, but others would have to come in a semester behind us. And so that's why we had the, if I, a group in the low ninth grade, there would already be a group in the high ninth grade who had started the semester before me. So that meant that there had to be two proms. Now we're talking poor black families, basically, having two proms. And it was a big thing by the time I got to high school 
the January poem, which would have been the uh, the class that was graduating in January. Mm -hmm. They would have been the high 12th grade. They were graduating in January. But all of the 12th grade went to the prom. But the cutest thing was that if you were not a senior, your prom dress had to be another color other than white. Mm -hmm. And the senior girls wore the white dresses. And then in May, when we had our prom, we had become the high 12th by then. Mm -hmm. We had our prom, then we could wear the white formal. And then uh, anybody else who was coming behind us would have to wear the any color formal. So it was kind of a cute custom that we did. We didn't have super expensive dresses or anything. Most of the dresses, our parents or an aunt or an uncle or grandparents made our dresses for us. And, uh, and none of this strapless, backless, mm -hmm. almost frontless stuff that people <laughs> wear now. We were... We were covered sufficiently, and we were very prim and proper. I just remember when I went to the January prom, mine was a yellowish, yellowish and yellowish kind of pattern, mm -hmm. and then of course I had the white one uh, when I went to the prom in May, and that was a big deal for us. And our class, I believe, was the first class. If I'm remembering this history correctly. I believe our class was the first class to be able to hold its prom, the first African-American class, hmm. a class of white students, to hold the prom at the Shamrock Hilton Hotel, hmm. which doesn't exist anymore. It was over there on the west side of what is now the medical center. It was right there on, and I think that's Greenbrier. Yeah. And all of the big names were coming to town to perform and entertain there. But it was over to us. But finally, you know, we were getting on the cusp of, integration and that was a big step forward as far as uh integrating houston now i've talked to other guests from houston they touched on the um the transition from segregation into integration in houston did you feel any sort of way or experience any strong racism while you were growing up well houston was a little different it's not like the, the deep south we had a lot of uh, segregation but it wasn't this cruel, what's called those Jim Crow laws. Mm -hmm. Houston wasn't quite like that. It just kept everybody separated. In the neighborhood that I grew up in, in um, the West End, it was just a mixed neighborhood of a few Hispanics, mostly black. Uh, the big store down on the corner, Colong's Food Store, there, there's a Chinese family there. So it was a little bit of a mixed one there. We all just got along. We just, no one went to school together or anything of that nature. But uh, as I was getting into college, when I started college, that's when, the year before I started college, I should say that, the year before I started college was when the uh, state universities became desegregated. And so I was able to go to the University of Houston, actually the second year that it had become desegregated. I had applied, and you know, for several schools, you don't know, apply for one, I applied for several, but I ended up going to the University of Houston and uh, met some wonderful friends that I'm still friends with to this day. Many of them talked with them and still see a lot of them socially. Many of them, many of us who have retired, we see each other. So it was somewhat of an easy, easier transition in Houston than it was in other parts of the country, especially in the Deep South. Now there's some sections in East Houston, you know, going toward uh, Louisiana, those sections of East Houston, it's a little bit more difficult to there, but it was fairly smoothly going on. Of course, we did have, uh, you know, the city and that the Woolworth stations and those kinds of things. We did have those, but we didn't have that awful, awful violence. There was a little bit sometimes at the city ends and at the various demonstrations. Uh, there was be some violence sometime or people getting arrested, but nothing like what was done in some of the deep southern states. So it was overall a somewhat smooth uh, transition. They had begun finally, after we were in college, and finally they had begun saying that the, the schools would be segregated. So we'll do one grade a year. So they started. So the first year, we'll integrate the first grade. Then the next year, it'll be first and second grade. Then the next year, it'll be first, second, and third grade, you know, where students could go to school closest to them. Mm -hmm. And that got to be old, and finally, with school board meeting, that with people protesting the, that it was going too slowly, finally it got to the point that students could have, we had one thing that was called freedom of choice, and you could kind of go out of your neighborhood mm -hmm. to go to a school, uh, you had to get a transfer in, uh, and it, they went through various systems, but they going one year, one 
grade year by year was just taking too long. And so they finally said, no, this is it. And then for a number of years, it was the freedom of choice. Then for one, then they changed that. And you had, they drew some zoning lines and you had to go to your school there. And then, of course, by the time HSPBA came along, HSPBA technically started the, um, the magnet program. And people could choose where they want to go to school outside of the area where they live if they wanted to specialize in a particular program. Uh, Mrs. Ruth Denny, who was the founder of PBA, she kept telling them, if you have a school where students are interested in the arts, they'll come from all over the city to come to that school. Uh, this was when she was getting, uh, tried to, talking and talking and talking to the powers that be in HISD. We need a school for the students who are specialized in the arts, but also offer the academics. And back in 1971, that's how HSPBA got started. But she had told them, if you have a school where they can specialize in the arts, students will come from all over Houston. And that's exactly what happened. I know this, this is new. Like I said, I never knew the details of uh, integration in, in Houston, especially the school districts. So I appreciate that. With you going to the University of Houston, what did you major in there? Uh, yeah, I went to the University of Houston. So my bachelor's degree was a Bachelor of Music uh, with emphasis in music education. And then I started back almost right away. I started teaching when I got the job where I, I went and for one or two courses I would take in the evening because I wanted to work on my master's degree right away so that I could begin to pay back my uh, student loans. Uh, and I began, I think right away that following fall taking classes in the evening eventually i went through the summers and got my master's degree and it was a master's in music with emphasis in music education um and both of them were from the university of houston I had some really good teachers in the music department there so i had some good teachers also in the music education department mm -hmm. and uh, that's really being at the university of houston is how i ended up at hspba because in one of our music education classes mm -hmm that you had to take it. This was when I was an undergraduate in the music education classes. We had to uh, take a course of co called choral music education. And the instructor would invite various choral music teachers to come and speak to us about teaching in the schools. This class was offered at night and these guest teachers would come. And that's how I met guest teacher, Mrs. Jean Galloway. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Galloway was the first choral teacher at HSPBA, but I met her uh, and, and she talked to the students there. Little did I know that one year later, when I was preparing to do what is called your student teaching, and we were receiving an all-level certificate in music education, I had to do student teaching at an elementary school and student teaching at a, a, a high school, secondary school, either junior high or senior high. I got assigned to Sterling high school which had just recently opened it's on the southeast side you might remember where it is yep that's where i lived and to, uh, i got assigned to student teaching at sterling and I, that's where mrs galloway jean galloway was there and i talked with her then i was very very blessed that uh after i finished college that june and i interviewed with hisd that was a new school that had just opened that january and it was the feeder school to Sterling High School, it was Albert Thomas Middle School. And that's how I got my first teaching job at Albert Thomas Middle School. And I taught there. Well, Jean Galloway, who had been my supervising teacher when I did my student teaching, who was still my friend there, she had some terrible back problems and all of that. And she had to take a leave of absence and stay home. And I think she had some surgeries and all of that. Eventually she got better and at the time that HSPBA was opening, they needed a part-time choral director. And uh, someone, I guess, had mentioned her, and she applied for it, and she became that part-time choral director. And that worked for the first two years of the school. But then by the third year, when the school was going to have 10th, 11th, that 12th grade, this was pre-middle school, mm -hmm. they were going to have 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Jean Galloway called me and said, do you think you'd be interested in coming here hmm. to teach at HSPBA? We need another choral teacher and uh, because we're going to have three full grades. Well, I knew about HSPBA because I had brought students 
from my school, Thomas Junior High at that time, I had brought them to performances at HSPBA. I just thought that they were oh, so interested okay. in reading about them and learning about them. And so I would have buses, you know, doing a field trip. And we would come at night or Friday night, whatever it was, and come to some of the concerts there. So I was familiar with the work at HSPBA. And I said, well, yes, I think I would. So she said, come in and talk to Mrs. Denny. And I talked to Mrs. Denny and she said, well, okay, you just take this. And, you know, told me to go to the administration building and she put in the paperwork. At that time, we weren't having to go through all of these panels of people and all of this other. <laughs> it was an easy transition for me, but it was because I was at the University of Houston, had met Jean Galloway, did my student teaching with Jean Galloway, and then uh, having her ask me to come on because they needed another teacher. And so I came and I saw it. I just stayed. Wow. I never knew that's how you got there. Okay. That's how I got there. Yeah, we got some jewels on this one. This is all new. I'm enjoying this. So you got there um, to HSPVA. Wait, pause. I don't want to go there just yet. So with college, um, before we get to your teaching experiences at HSPVA, um, did you pledge anything at the University of Houston? Oh, my goodness. I was pledging, studying, and getting my degree. I had no money. I said, it cost money to do that kind of thing. Yes, it did. Money. We didn't have money for that. Mm. We just we went to school. We got student defense loans. Mm -hmm. We got lots of scholarships and grants. And then took as few loans as we could, but did them through the national defense, which was the government. But there was no money for, for extra things like, like that. that. I mm. you know, studied. I was doing good to be able to get my books with the loans. I was riding the bus. To, uh, to school, you know, riding the bus home. Uh, that, that was just, that was, there was no money for those kinds of luxuries. And to be perfectly honest, I really didn't have an interest in that. I okay. mean, I have nothing against it, but it just wasn't my social thing. But uh, even if it had been my social thing, we didn't have the funds for that. Did you ever want to get married, have any kids? Was that ever in your whole goal of trying to, you know, live the American dream? Well, I don't know if you set those goals for yourself i think sometimes those things just just happen in the course of living and uh, i was totally involved in school and my life was wrapped around that and mm -hmm. that's what happened that was life and that's what happened and i was very pleased and i have no regrets no i don't regrets. look back uh, mm -hmm. you know life happens and sometimes you don't have to plan it it just happens and that's kind of what happened to me so i just claimed every student that i taught as my own and, and that's enough <laughs> yeah i was gonna tell you i said well since you didn't have kids biologically you got thousands of ones that you've adopted through this whole process of teaching and yes, me and me included and of course i have uh, nieces and nephews and young cousins who are like nieces and nephews to me mm -hmm. so i've had i've had my share of children i still get a various mother's day cards and Christmas cards from others. So I've had my share of children. Did you feel like that you knew you had the patience to deal with these knucklehead kids or did it take time? You grow. Each year that you teach, you learn something and you grow. And uh, you have to remember that over the years, the student bodies change. What parents expected of teachers, what students expected of teachers, how students behaved in class, depending upon how they were brought up at home. So things changed from year to year, and we just had to deal with it. The main thing, we wanted students to, to learn, to do their very, very best, and to be respectful of each other and of us, and for us to be respectful of them. And that was just kind of our way of doing things. So when you got to HSPVA, did you start off in choral conducting? That was your first position? Uh -huh. I was hired as the second choir director. Second choir director. Yes. Okay. But I also taught, I taught, of course, music theory, mm. and eventually, uh, down past down years, I taught some music history and music theory. But it was as a choral director, teaching ensembles and teaching music theory. That's what I taught the first uh, couple of years there. And then, it, as the student body grew and everything, it expanded. And okay. Especially once we moved to the school on Stanford Street, mm -hmm. uh, we were able to offer a few more uh, classes, and so I eventually taught those and you know, taught the senior recital classes because we didn't even have those classes at the first campus because we had no place to hold it or even have a decent recital. We would present some recitals, but they'd be in this old broken down classroom mm -hmm. 
with the worst piano probably in the history of the world. <laughs> but then as the program expanded and we got a little bit more space, we, uh, uh, I could, we could expand the things that we taught, even though by the time we had moved to the building that you know there on Stanford, uh, we had outgrown it because when the ground was broken for it, it was for 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And by the time we went into the school two years later, we had already acquired a ninth grade because the state of Texas basically went to the middle school, ninth grade and high school uh, system. And so we had already outgrown that facility there on Stanford. So you got to HSPVA, was that in 1970-something? Uh, yeah, the third year of the school. The third year of the school was 73, 74. Okay, 73, 74 is when you got there. Yeah, that's when we had actually had a full 10th, 11th, and 12th grade class. When they started in 71, it was basically 10th grade and a scattering of, you know, 11th and 12th graders who would come for one year. And then the next year, the same thing, yes, uh, more 10th graders. Grade. But then by the time they got to the third year of the school, they were going to have 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, three full classes of those. And that's why a second choral teacher was needed. They had brought on in the meantime a uh, Dr. Morgan, who doing the jazz band because Mr. Trongoni was there trying to do jazz bands and the orchestra. Uh, and so this divided their responsibilities there. So as the school grew with the student body, that's when teachers were added and we were able to eventually expand our offerings. Okay. Once you got there and the school getting established, were you involved with, I guess, how they were setting up the auditioning process and what the expectations were for certain students and styles and stuff like that? Yeah, we were, we would, uh, each art area would hold its own auditions. And uh, it was simple audition. Uh, it wasn't as complicated as it is now. It's very complicated and it's a two audition process. But the students would come, they would a selection of their choosing for us and we would check their ears and give them a little bit of sight reading and uh, also during this time especially in the 70s and the 80s we had more students who were very very qualified because the fine arts programs in most of the junior high schools were quite uh, functional at that time and so we had lots of students to audition but it was just simply you come in and you sing a song, we kind of interview you to determine your interest, a little bit of sight singing to see if you were able to follow the notes, but students were able to select their own songs. But then over the years, as the magnet programs grew, things had to change to meet certain district requirements. But uh, the main thing now, and even still to this day, even although they have to go through a two audition process, is singing and seeing if the student has a good ear, if the student's able to follow a choral score, you know, checking with the background, et cetera. That's what, the, that's what it's all about. You just have to know if there is an interest, number one, and if it's a background uh, in music. We would get students whose background would range from having started music lessons at the age of five or six or seven and going all the way through junior high mm -hmm. to those who only got music once they got into schools in fifth and sixth grade and maybe a choir or a band or whatever in the... Uh, uh, in middle school. So it, it's come, it had come a long way as far as the auditions, but now with all of the state testing and everything that's been involved, there are fewer and fewer fine arts classes offered on campuses. There will be a handful of campuses that have band, choir, orchestra, and visual arts, but more than likely many of the schools will only offer one or two of those and that's the same thing even in the elementary and the middle school. So it has become more difficult to get students who are fully, fully qualified. So students have to be accepted based on the fact that you have a talent and we can teach you. And that's what teachers do. We take what we have and we teach them. The happenings. I always wanted to know, did that start at the inception of HSPVA or was yes. that? Okay. Yes. The Spaghetti Supper and the Happening were the two big things that were the tradition. And we had a happening this past Tuesday, you know, the typical Halloween happening. The costumes with these creative minds are just beautiful, magnificent. So they still have the happening. Uh, when we were at the uh, uh, first campus, the happenings were held outdoors on a large triangular-shaped stage that had been built outdoors 
for it. And that's where the happenings were. And of course, they were in the commons once we got to Stanford Street. And they're still in the commons now over here on, on back of Austin Street. But yes, the happenings were the big thing. Uh, they're doing a little bit differently now. The early happenings, uh, the Julia Hall can especially say this, the early happenings would be people would just try to show up and say, well, I want to do this and I want to do that, or I sing or I dance, or I have this group of, and we play guitar, we play jazz, and they would kind of do it, and it really was a happening. And now, of course, as it grew, we have a happening committee, and there's one happening each six weeks. It's been like that for a long time. Hmm. One happening each six weeks, and there's a a happenings chairperson and all that, and students submit what they'd like to do on the happenings. And keeping in mind, you're talking 35 minutes worth of whatever. So it varies. But the Halloween happening was a hoop this year, like it always is. <laughs> so with HSPVA growing, when did you start blossoming past just being a core conductor, theory, and music history? When did you start getting into the admin part of it? No, I was never into the ad- administrative part at all. Mm. The only people that we worked with I mean, we obviously worked with the counselors and all that, but all I did was teach. So straight teaching, never got straight into the whole state. paperwork. You know, for, for a number of years, I was chairperson for the entire music department. Most of the time, I was chairperson. Starting in 1980, maybe 81, I was chairperson for the vocal department. And then for about 10 years or 12 years, I was chairperson for the entire music department. Boy, that was a tough job. <laughs> and then we finally broke it back down, and I was chairperson for the vocal department. And it worked on... You know, I work on different committees and things at school, but I was never in administration. I didn't want that. I wanted to stay in the classroom. So no principal? You didn't want to do none of that? No, I didn't want to do it. I didn't care how much money it paid. <laughs> no, I wanted to stay in the classroom with the students. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to teach. So question about a little bit of personal life. Do you have a favorite food? Fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables. So uh, fruits and vegetables, and I, and I do love dark chocolate. Okay, so that's your dessert, so the dessert thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm basically, uh, you know, uh, a chicken, fish, and turkey, you know. Okay. And every now and then they have burger. But I'm basically fish, and chicken, and turkey. But I love vegetables and fruit. I pick big fruit smoothie just about every morning. Oh, do you have any favorite alcoholic beverages? Oh, I don't drink alcoholic beverages. I'm without them. No libations. No libations. Well, you know, you call iced tea, lemonade, and water. <laughs> so that's about it. No spirits, yeah, in, though. In the wintertime, if it ever gets cold enough, you know, a good hot chocolate or hot tea, but mm-hmm. I, I don't like the taste of it, and, you know, I, I, I do without it. I understand. Yeah. So do you have any particular uh, artist, favorite artist? Well, the one that I really, really like, the great late uh, Marion Anderson, mm. uh, Loved her, and then uh, uh, Leah King Price, of course, the opera. She's still, she's not seen in a long time. I think she's in her early 90s now, but I loved her. And I, Pastel uh, Domingo, I loved her, this tenor voice, Cheryl Mill, like a lot of the opera singers. I also like a lot of the classical pianists. Um, I like a lot of the big major choruses, professional choruses. Uh, I, I like hearing them. And I like a lot of good musical theater. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's with various artists, with various artists. And I've heard some really, really fine artists over the years, including some of our HSPBA alums. And that's mm-hmm. one of the reasons I go to New York. So I have a kind of an eclectic taste uh, in, in all of those things. Okay. What about spirituals? Do you like any well, uh, spiritual? Absolutely. That's why I love Marion Anderson so much. And there are so many now, like Denise Craig, and of course the great lady, Jesse Norman, whom I just adored. And she unfortunately passed away rather suddenly. I guess it's been four years ago now. Uh, just adore her. But they all, I have, I don't know how many recordings of all of those great singing spirituals. And then one of my final questions I was thinking about, do you have any students that stand out that were your favorites? Oh, well, you know, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> but my favorites have a lot that I just absolutely adore. <laughs> And, and all of them are just great students. There's so many who are doing such wonderful things in all fields, uh, in the arts and in non-arts related. I mean, we have lawyers, and doctors, and accountants, mm-hmm. and then all of the wonderful performances. So I can't say I have a student. The thing I can say is that I am proud of everything that the students that I taught, everything that they're doing, as long as it's good work and they're doing, um, working in their communities, they're working in their, so many who are working in their churches, and on Broadway, and a few of the movies, whatever they're doing, if it's good work, I'm proud of them. So 
I can't say I have a favorite, favorite, but I have lots of really, really good talent that I'm very, very proud of. Well, uh, I've kept you long enough, but I just wanted to let you know that it's been an honor and a pleasure to be able to sit down with you because, I mean, like I said, you're one of the most impactful people that has influenced my life. And I just wanted to be sure to give you your flowers and tell you how great and wonderful you are. In my humble opinion, if there had to be a logo and face of the HSBVA campus, it would definitely be yours. So, so, <laughs> so well, you know, they, did, they, they named the recital hall when you build the application. Mm-hmm. They took the name on the recital hall with a big painting and everything in the entryway. But I'm glad to see, I, I like to see that you have the city theater in your background. Yes. This, uh, interview. Yeah, that, that, the theater is just so wonderful. We just finished the musical last week. It's called The Prom. And we have a professional orchestra kid and so many students from all the art areas participating. So it was a really, really good musical. But that theater that's behind you, that is the crown jewel of our campus. That is Ruth Denny founded. HSPBA would be so very proud. I think so, because that place has definitely grown, and I'm sure it's been the foundation for uh, so many people throughout the world. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Well, again, I appreciate you coming on to Houston Hometown Heroes, because you are a Houston Hometown Hero, and we appreciate you and love you over here. <laughs>